Hi, welcome to the first annual uh, Vote Hacking Village here at DEF CON. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, so my name's Jake Braun. I, uh, this ridiculous thing was my idea, and so somehow that landed me as the MC today. Um, so I'll be in here all day inter introducing people. Um, welcome. And uh, um, I uh, was the White House liaison to the Department of Homeland Security. I run a small uh, national security and cybersecurity uh, strategy and policy consulting firm called Cambridge Global Advisors. And I teach cyber policy at the University of Chicago. Um, so just to do some quick table setting on what we're actually trying to achieve here and kind of what we're not trying to achieve here as well before I introduce our first speakers. Um, let me just start by saying anybody who thinks that their machines, network, or database can't be hacked is either a fool or a liar, right? I think that's actually a totally uncontroversial thing to say at a place like this. However, unfortunately, um, it's, it's a pretty controversial thing to say um, in, in the election space. Um, and by the way, because of some of the great work that this conference has done over the last 20 years, 25 years, um, you've got people in some of the uh, top industries, top countries, or top companies in the world, Apple, Google, Lockheed Martin, JP Morgan, even the NSA, would never say with a straight face, we can't be hacked, we're unhackable. And by the way, 20 years ago, they were all saying the same thing that we hear today in the election industry. Oh, our machines don't never touch the internet. You know, our databases are air-gapped and backed up all the time, all this stuff. Um, well, now, not only, again, because of the great work um, DEF CON has done, not only would all these industries say that they're hackable, they would say we're probably being hacked right now, successfully, by multiple different actors, right? Um, and so the goal of, of what we're trying to do here is not to play gotcha and show we can hack into this machine or that database or or this county clerk's whatever. Um, first of all, A, we already know that we can, right? The Russians have already done it. And, uh, and many researchers have already done it. It's just they haven't been able to, to make their research public. Um, that's not the point. The point of this is actually much greater. The point is to erase the idea of unhackability from the election industry writ large. Why is that important? Well, that's important because uh, we are actually now under a direct existential threat to the United States from a foreign adversary who has essentially unlimited uh, resources, Russia. Um, and until we can get this industry to, to get the whole concept of unhackability out of their mind, we won't be able to begin to start um, securing our democracy. Um, and so what we, what we seek to do um, as, as this goes on year after year is help get this industry to come around and again realize that, that they are hackable. They will be hacked. The Russians are going to be back. Other bad guys are going to be back and they're going to get in. And so then what do they need to do? As our friends from, friends from Verified Voting are going to talk about. Um, they need to actually talk to each other and share threat information. Uh, they need to take the help of, of, um, ha of the hacker community in securing their networks and they need to work with, with uh, our national security apparatus in this country to help secure their networks. And by the way, you know, Google, Facebook, Apple, Lockheed Martin, JP Morgan, none of them wanted to work with the national security apparatus 20 years ago when they were first being um, hacked and so on. But, you know, they're sitting duck when there's a nation state after them. And they've all now realized this and the election industry needs, needs to do the same. And so uh, on that note, by the way, one thing I do want to point out um, before we get started is that if it wasn't for some really amazing local election officials um, like uh, Dean Logan in LA, Ricky Hatch in Utah, Lance Goff in Chicago, and some other people in the Chicago area that prefer to re remain nameless, um, helping us with this uh, and really taking, uh, understanding this for what it is, which is an opportunity, again, not for us to play gotcha, but for their staff uh, to get access to some great training and to have some great research done on, on their uh, um, systems and machines and so on. Um, none of this would have been possible. So I do want to give the election officials who helped us with this a round of applause before we get started. So. Um, okay, so without further ado, our first speakers. Um, David Jefferson is the board chair of Verified Voting. Um, Verified Voting has been working on, on this issue for well over a decade. decade. David is a, a visiting computer scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, where he works on supercomputing applications, but has also been active in research um, in this space um, since, uh, well, for, for decades. Um, in 1994, while a digital equipment corporation, he oversaw development of the California election server 
the first web server anywhere to provide online voting information on candidates and issues. In 1995, he helped develop, in cooperation with the California Voter Foundation, the first online database of campaign finance information ever for the San Francisco municipal elections um, that year. And Barbara Simons uh, is the president of Verified Voting, um, same organization. Uh, Barbara has been on the board of advisors of the U.S. Election Assistant Commission since 2008. She published um, a book called Broken Ballots that you should all read. Um, and uh, uh, on voting machines that she co-authored co um, with a guy named Douglas Jones. She also co-authored a report that led to the cancellation of Department of Defense Internet Voting Service. Done? Okay. Oh, and but I, can't, I have to say that she's also the former president of the Association for um, Computing Machinery, the largest and oldest international educational scientific society for computing professionals. All right. So uh, Barbara and David, please come up. All right, so I'm going to speak first, and I'm, what I'm going to try to talk to you about is the ecosystem of hardware and software and procedures in a, a, a U.S. election. There's a lot of concentration in people's minds on the voting machines themselves. Those are the gray ones that I have in this diagram, but there's a lot more to it than that, and I want to introduce you to what it is. When you learn the architecture about the information flows in, uh, in an election, uh, you'll, you'll be able to understand the vulnerabilities um, that are not obvious otherwise. Now, I'm going to probably just get rid of this microphone and speak to the diagram. I think you'll all be recording. Oh, you will be recording. All right, then I'm going to have to move. Can I do that? No, I don't mind. Okay. Oops. All right. So um, there are basically uh, three kinds of information flows in an election. The red arrows here talk about the flow of software and firmware through the system. Uh, the green arrows talk about the election definition, uh, which is data that describes the election, uh, what the candidates are, what the propositions are, where, they, wh where, you, wh where the boxes are that you touch or, or uh, check. And then the blue arrows, uh, are the flow of votes and ballot information and derived information from, from them. And then I have dotted lines here for in the case of voter where uh, systems have what's called a voter verified paper trail. Now, um, I'm going to go over this uh, quickly and then I'm going to retrace in some, with some particular marks about the software. So first of all, in the top left corner, you see the vendor. The vendor is the uh, company that both builds or contracts for the building of the voting machines themselves and also writes all of the software for the, for the voting machines. Not just the terminal voting machines where voters uh, 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 record their vote, but also the back, whoops, pardon me? The back end canvas computers that uh, aggregate all the votes from the voting machines and, uh, and produce the, the final results. So um, let's look, follow the red arrows from the vendor. The vendor, there are very few vendors in the country, a handful, five, six uh, nationally. There are thousands of jurisdictions. So many vendors, or e each vendor uh, sells to many jurisdictions. Um, the vendor writes the software for both the voting machines and for the Canvas computers. Those are treated as a single product and a, and a given jurisdiction buys all of its software, both front-end and back-end, from the same vendor. Uh, the vendor then uh, sells its uh, systems and services to the various jurisdictions. So the next line there is supposed to represent local election officials, government officials, who are legally responsible for the conduct of the election. Uh, they get copies of the software from the vendors. They only get binaries. They never see the source. Um, that's w one of the issues that I'll come back to later. Uh, they load those binaries prior to an election. They load those binaries onto the voting machines that are going to be distributed out into the, uh, into the, uh, the precincts in the jurisdiction. Um, the, uh, 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 this diagram is talking about uh, electronic voting machines such as you have over there in the... Um, in the uh, hackers uh, 
forum over there. Um, you could vary this diagram for jurisdictions that use um, optical scan voting systems, but uh, for purposes of today, I'm talking about electronic voting machines. All right, so the vendors, uh, sorry, the, the election officials install software in all of the voting machines, and they distribute all of the voting machines to each precinct uh, a few days before the election. The voting machines sit there for a while in the custody of, uh, maybe in nobody's custody, they may just be locked in a closet, or they may just be sitting in a hall somewhere, or they may be in the custody of a, of a poll worker, but they find their ways to the poll on the election day. Uh, also, the election officials uh, install the software in the Canvas systems and the, uh, the so-called election management systems. Um, and uh, ideally, the election officials are the ones who run the Canvas and run the election management system. However, more and more it seems to be the case that uh, jurisdictions don't actually do that. They also outsource uh, the, the running of these applications, the back-end applications, to the, the very same vendors. Um, so that's the flow of software to the voting machines and to the uh, election management and Canvas systems. Um, the flow of election definition uh, data that describes the election also comes from the, the vendors uh, to the election officials, and the election officials load it load it onto the voting machines and to the Canvas systems. Uh, oftentimes, they outsource the production of that election definition file also to the vendors. Um, so the vendors play an absolutely critical central role here, oftentimes a much, more, a much stronger role than even the election officials do. Uh, the flow of votes, of course, a voter walks into a precinct, um, authenticates himself as being allowed to vote, uh, in this election, being registered uh, in this precinct, uh, walks over to a voting machine, uh, casts his, his vote. Um, at the end of the day, at the end of election day, all of the votes are recorded on memory cards that were inserted somewhere in the, uh, in the back of the voting machine. Uh, ideally, those memory cards are removed at the end of the day and hand transported by poll workers to the, back to the county where they are read by the Canvas machines and the Canvas systems uh, aggregate all the, all the results and determine uh, who has won the election. Of course, they have to deal with absentee ballots as well, and there are many other kinds of, uh, many kinds of ballots. You have to deal with provisional ballots, so on. it's much more complicated than I'm talking about, but this is idealized. Eventually, the Canvas report is published, and that indicates to the world who's supposed to have won the election. Now, let me do a time check here. Okay. Um, some electronic voting machines have a feature called the verified, uh, voter verified paper audit trail. Some of the machines that you will see down the hall have them, some do not. The voter verified paper audit trail was a late addition to the concept of an electronic voting machine uh, in an attempt to deal with the security weaknesses of all electronic voting machines. Because with the all electronic voting machines, you basically have to trust all the software. Uh, we did not want to be in that position, so we tried to, shall we say, backpatch by adding a, a uh, voter verified paper trail. And the way that works is this. When the voter is standing at the voting machine and presses that cast my ballot button. Of course, his, his ballot is recorded electronically, but it is also printed on paper uh, at the side of the voting machine, and the voter is supposed to look at that, and the voter is supposed to verify what's printed on the paper is the way I intended to vote, and he's supposed to report it if there's any difference. As a matter of fact, hardly anybody ever does that, which is one of the profound weaknesses of the VVPAT concept. But if we assume that voters actually did that, then that printed audit trail from every voting machine, um, which now the voters have verified contains their true uh, intents, in principle, they could all be aggregated and looked at. It's on paper now. And the paper copies of the votes are, of course, immune to any kind of software attack. That's the beauty of it. No matter whether they're bugs or malicious code, anywhere in the line, the paper trail is immune to, to that kind of attack or failure. So ideally, you could, you could, 
Okay, you could take a random sample uh, of, or, or the entire corpus of uh, voter verified paper records and compare them to the Canvas report. And if there were differences, you could know there's a problem somewhere in the software, in the procedures used to, uh, to, to aggregate or, or possibly malicious code. And um, if, the, if the law so supported it, you could actually uh, presumably prefer the results from the hand counted paper audit trail. The law doesn't prefer this, but I mean, in principle, it could. So that's the, uh, that's the general flow of software, votes, and um, election data. And I just want to make a few quick comments about the software itself before I turn this over to uh, my colleague Barbara Simons. Um, the software written by the, is written by anonymous programmers uh, who work for the vendors. We don't really know who they are. We don't know how they're vetted. They do not have to have security clearances. We know they're anonymous. Um, the software itself is considered proprietary by the vendors. It is, uh, they are very protective of that proprietary nature. Uh, so there's a network of law and contract restrictions and NDAs that prevent you or me or anybody else from really uh, seeing the insides of that software. A few of us have under certain circumstances been able to see that so the source code, but most people are not. And that includes election officials. Election officials all over the country are running software and they do not even have the, the, the source. Um, a lot of the software in both the voting machines and the Canvas systems is COTS software, commercial off-the-shelf stuff. It's mostly operating system stuff. Um, you will note that mo when you go down there, you will see that some of these systems are so old, they're running Windows XP, they're running Windows CE, some of them run Windows 2000. Nothing, nowhere in the country are they running systems uh, newer than these, or, or hardly anywhere. If I'm not aware of any. I mean, these are old. And the reason that they are so old is because once they are certified, you can't change a voting system without going through a complete recertification process, which is long, slow, and expensive. The security features of these systems from beginning to end are especially weak. Uh, the weak points would include the software update and installation process, the password and key management, uh, cryptography and randomization, all generally very weak, and even the physical security, the ports and, uh, and seals on voting machines when, they are, uh, when, when they're in storage and when they're in use, um, it, it's a mess. Uh, I already mentioned that the software has to be certified to meet uh, certain federal standards. These are drafted by NIST and the EAC. You'll hear more about that in the next panel, so I'm not going to go into that now, except to say that the current standards are over a decade old, quite weak in the subject of security, and they're only voluntary on the states anyway, uh, and they're enforced only by testing protocols, not by any kind of deep analysis of, uh, of the source code. Um, so this, uh, I, I think I'm going to stop there and uh, turn this over to Barbara Simons, uh, my colleague. Barbara. No. It's easy to trip over. You should go ahead. Okay, I, I guess this uh, this will work. Uh, I'm not going to bother with having slides up because um, they're not very exciting. Uh, I'm going to be exciting, but the slides aren't exciting. So, um, first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming here and for working on this really, really important issue. I mean, we need to get many more people involved. We need to be able to show that there are major problems with these machines. And I'm hoping that some of you will actually be able to show that with the work you're doing here. So thank you very much. Um, Heretofore, it's been very difficult for independent experts to examine these machines for some of the reasons that David mentioned. Uh, the software is proprietary, and some of you guys probably know the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which makes it very difficult to, uh, to examine software uh, if you don't have permission to do so. So uh, there's been an exception made which allows this to go forward, this, this hacking village to go forward. Uh, fortunately, that will remain for more than like the next year or two, but uh, we may, it, they may take it away. So that's another issue. Um, 
as David said, early te the testing is totally inadequate. The early testing was even worse. A lot of these machines that are in use, some of them the ones that you'll see there, were certified to early testing, uh, where there was no penetration testing. I mean, can you imagine? They had a list of, of requirements. I mean, can you imagine a major software vendor doing testing by just checking off a list of requirements like single entry, single exit loop without doing penetration testing? And yet that's what's, what's been done for many of these voting machines. Um, the results are, are sometimes secret. So even the testing results are secret. And there's a case in California where the then Secretary of State, Kevin Shelley, tried to get the test results from Diebold machines because he was concerned about the Diebolds that were being used in California. And the testing agency said to him, these results are owned by Diebold, and you can't get them from us. You have to get them from Diebold. And of course, Diebold wouldn't turn them over. So even a very um, a proactive election official who wants to know what's happening, who wants to know the test results, uh, couldn't get them. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got here. And, and the story kind of begins back with Florida 2000, which of course I'm sure so those of you who aren't old enough to remember what happened have probably heard of it, and some of us are old enough to remember. Uh, and that, but what really happened was Florida 2002, because they had more problems in the midterm in Florida also. As a result, the Help America Vote Act was passed in 2002, and it allocated about $3 billion, that's with a B, dollars to replace voting systems. And one of the unfortunate conclusions that a number of people reached from Florida 2000 was that paper is bad. Paper is bad, paperless is good. And in fact, I would go further than that to say that there was also an effort made to um, I'm not sure if exploit is the right word, but to manipulate voters with disabilities because there, was, there were people going around saying uh, paper, machines with paper discriminate against voters with disabilities, as if all voters with disabilities had vision problems, and as if there weren't alternatives for people who do have vision problems. So a lot of people felt that, that to support paper was to be against voters with disabilities, which is a really bad place to be put, I mean, as a policymaker. So that's something else that happened. Um, and of course, all this money was suddenly made available. Election officials wanted to get it, and they wanted to get the newest and greatest shiny object. And, uh, and, not only, and so the vendors would say, completely secure, federally certified, we already know what that meant. Um, and of course, you, 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 they could just touch a button at the end of the day and get the results. And if you're a hardworking election official, that sounds really good. You can go home you know, at some decent hour of the night and you don't have to worry. No recount, it's perfect. You're done. So it was very appealing. Plus there was sort of a gold rush mentality. Everybody wanted to get this newest thing and besides they wanted to get, have, have, get the money while it was still there. So there was a big rush to buy machines. Um, and of course computers had to be introduced. If you're gonna go paperless, you need computers. David's already talked a bit about direct recording electronic machines. These are uh, the machines where, which directly record the vote. So the typical one will show the vote on the screen you will touch the screen, They're not all, they weren't all touch screen, but most of them were. You would touch the screen for your candidate, and presumably that information would be stored in the memory of the computer. And initially, m most of them were paperless. Um, there were, of course, issues even early on because if the machines were not properly calibrated, you could have problems. You would have jumping votes and people, you know, and, and we've seen this a lot in recent elections where, say, where they said, you know, um, I, I voted for uh, Obama and this other candidate's name, you know. And then people would say, these machines aren't secure because I touched the, vote for the button for candidate A and candidate B's name appeared. But in fact, we don't know if that was insecure or not because we don't know what happened inside these machines. So it's quite possible they touched the button for candidate A and A was recorded in the machine, or maybe B was recorded in the memory. We don't know because, of course, nobody knows. So these machines, on top of everything else, were really badly engineered. I mean, the technology of the touchscreen machine was bad because it had to be constantly recalibrated. They were insecure. The testing was lousy. It was a bad deal all the way around. And yet, they were used almost throughout the country. Um, in response, as David said, when, when the computer scientists and other people, election, uh, activists started complaining about this, these, they were, there were retrofits with these voter verified paper audit trails, uh, which tended to be con continuous roll thermal paper. 
uh, with small font that was hard to read, bad human factors. One of the major vendors recorded every single step that the, ele that the voter did, which made it very hard to figure out what your final results were. Um, people didn't look at them. And then if you did want to recount them, it was a continuous roll, which is hard to recount. Thermal printed, like what you get at a gas station, which can fade in the heat. I mean, again, so really badly engineered machines were retrofitted with really bad retrofits. I mean, they were at least consistent. So there were also paper ballot systems. Typically, these are what we call upscan systems, where you have a paper ballot. Uh, in California, you connect the, a broken arrow to, to decide who you're going to, you know, to signify who your selection is. Some places, there'll be, you know, you fill in an oval. And then these machines are put through scanners, which, of course, have computers in them. Uh, so there are, again, problems with the scanners. If they're not calibrated properly, uh, they may, if, if they're calibrated to be too sensitive, they may pick up stray marks and think that you voted twice, which you're not supposed to do. If they're not sensitive enough, they may miss. So there are calibration problems there too, but the good news is that there are paper ballots. So with, if there's malware or software bugs uh, or calibration problems, you can find them if you look at the paper ballots. Another advantage, of course, is that uh, with paper ballots, if the scanner is down, people can vote the paper ballots and deposit them in a ballot box for counting later. So it's a way to avoid long lines, although ironically, we've seen in the past couple of elections that sometimes poll workers don't even know you can do that. And so the lines still, they still form because poll workers don't tell voters that they don't have to wait for the scanners. Um, there's another problem, which is that um, a lot of people don't understand that these things have computers in them. I mean, that might, I'm sure this audience finds that hard to believe, but in fact, people don't understand that the way the scanner works is it's basically a computer. So we saw in Wisconsin, in the recount in 2016 in Wisconsin, that some places did a recount by manually recounting the ballots, which is what a recount is. Other parts rescanned them. They put the ballots back into the scanners, which does not check the computer. I mean, it's sort of a silly exercise, but that's an example of the lack of understanding. So um, I think I'll talk a little bit about Diebold, because Diebold is the poster child of all that's wrong with these machines. And I have to say, in Diebold's defense, they, I mean, they did have really lousy security, and they did post their software on an open FTP website just asking for people to download. I mean, they weren't asking, but you know, they set it up so that it could be downloaded and checked. So yeah, they deserve a lot of what they got. But the fact is, the vendors were all bad. Uh, we, we know that at this point. But anyway, Diebold, in, uh, in 2002 was used in Georgia, in a Georgia, major Georgia midterm, where both the senator, Senator Max Cleland, and the governor uh, were ahead in the polls, and they both lost. So we don't know if they truly lost or if there was a problem. What we do know is that there were last minute changes being made to the software with no oversight. Now, anyone who's worked on a large software project knows that you're always making last minute changes, you know, until the company releases it because you're always finding problems. So there could have been very legitimate reasons for these last minute changes, or somebody could have decided who they wanted to win. We don't know. And nobody examined the software, and of course that software is long gone. So, um, and, and it was paperless. So these machines were used in Georgia 2002. In 2003, as I said, uh, somebody, actually a journalist, found Diebold software on an open FTP website and downloaded it, handed it off to some security people at Johns Hopkins and Rice, and they examined that software, and that was the first case where we've had an independent examination done by, people, by computer security experts. They found, um, uh, they found gaping holes. For example, uh, there was a single key, a single key to encrypt all the data on every storage device, uh, and it was, in, it was in the program text. And that key was F2654HD4. That's all you needed. So that was one of the things they found. In 2006, there was another study. Well, there have been a lot of studies. I'm skipping over a lot of material. In the book I wrote, there's a whole chapter on deep old. If, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. But in 2006, the Princeton team um, showed how to implant a virus on a deep old machine, on, deep old, on these deep old machines, uh, so that you could um, basically rig an election. In fact, they testified before Congress on that. Ed Felton did. Um, they also noted that uh, the um, slot which contains the memory card has a lock. 
uh, and you could open that lock using a standard hotel bar key. And it, they're pretty standard. So it was also easy to pick, but you didn't even have to bother. You just get this bar key. Um, these same machines are in use today in Georgia. They were used for the Georgia CD50 election. Some of you may recall that election. $50 million were spent. This was for a House of Representatives seat. It was the most expensive election ever. And actually, um, there were some other problems found in Georgia, which I won't go into. One of the people who found them, Logan Lamb, is here. And so when I finish, he's going to come up and just talk a little bit about Georgia, uh, because it's, that's also an interesting story. But these machines are still there, still use, in use today. And there's no justification whatsoever for their use. So there have been some studies. So you guys are not the first ones to try to look at these machines. There have been a couple of studies that were sponsored by secretaries of state. And David mentioned how he was able to look at something because he was involved with these studies. So in California, the Secretary of State Bowen uh, did what was called a top to bottom review. And um, she required the vendors to produce the machines and the software and all the, all the related material for getting an election set up. And she was only able to do that because of a court case that had happened a few years earlier with an earlier, with Kevin Shelley, an earlier S Secretary of State who actually went to court and won. That's the only way she could get these machines. I mean, you wouldn't believe how hard it is for people to get their hands on them. So they, she, she basically went to the University of California. Um, they put together, a, and some folks put together a team. They examined the security, the, the, the documentation, the accessibility. It's the only time that, that these machines have ever been examined to see how easy they are for voters with disabilities to use. They did badly on everything. And I should mention, uh, there's some people here, like Candace Hoke is here, who was one of the people involved with this. Matt Blaze was also. Um, in fact, Matt Blaze had an interesting quote. Um, we found significant deep-rooted security weaknesses in all three vendors' software. It should now be clear that the red teams were successful not because they somehow cheated, but rather because the built-in security mechanisms they were up against simply don't work properly. There was a pervasive lack of good security engineering across all three systems. So as I said, it's not just Diebold. These were two other systems as well, I believe ES and S, and what was the third one? Was it Hart? I don't know. Hart and Pacific, yeah. So the red teams were able to break into all of them. That should be inspiration to you guys. Uh, the California study was validated by a subsequent study done in Ohio called the Everest study, uh, which also again brought together you know, really good uh, security people. They, found, they, they, they basically found that they validated everything that was discovered in California, plus they found more problems. This was back in 2006, 2007. And some of these machines are still in use today. They were still used for the 2016 election. To my way of thinking, this is nothing short of a national scandal. In addition, many of the old machines are falling apart. Uh, David's already mentioned some of the ancient software that's on them and the fact that it, it's not even updated frequently, even with our, our updates, because of the whole certification issue, because then they need to be recertified. Um, so there's a catch-22 on top of everything else. If you want to be conscientious and update your software, then you've got to go through recertification, in which can be expensive and time-consuming. So if you don't want to go through that, you don't update. Um, the hardware is also failing. I mean, these machines are just literally falling apart in some cases, and some election officials are having to cannibalize other machines to keep some of the machines going. So election officials actually do want to replace these machines. I mean, this is not a case where we are fighting against election officials. The problem is there isn't money. And so that's another issue, uh, obviously not directly related to DEF CON, but that's something we need to be concerned about. Um, oh, I should just mention that you've all, I'm sure, heard about the long lines in 2012 and 2016. A lot of these were caused by the DREs, the direct recording electronic machines, because unlike paper ballots, you must vote on the machine. If, the machi if there are some machines that are down, or if there are long lines, a lot of people want coming to the polls at the same time, you have to wait or not vote and go to work because you can't afford to spend an hour waiting in line. So the good news, I mean, Jake talked about how we are under attack, and I agree. I lose sleep over this, and I hope you will too <laughs> because we have to fix the problem. But we know how to protect ourselves against hacking. We have the solution, and it's pretty straightforward. We need paper ballots, 
and we need manual post-election ballot audits to check that the computers that count the paper are working correctly. If we can get that nationwide, we'll be safe from hacking of our voting systems. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about the voter registration databases. That's a different issue. We need, to do, we need to take significant steps there, too, to protect those. But if you look at the voting technology itself, paper ballots, manual post-election ballot audits. By the way, you have to randomly select the ballots, clearly, because if you don't use randomness, the bad guys will know what you're going to look at, and they'll, they won't touch it. They'll just touch the other stuff. And incidentally, a lot of people don't know what random means. Uh, sometimes election officials will announce beforehand what they're going to, you know, which, which precincts or whatever they're going to look at. That ain't random. Uh, so, um, one of the problems we've had historically is convincing people that this is a problem. Not people like you, but the press, policymakers, election officials. And I've talked to a lot of reporters where they say to me, well, give us an example of, a, of, a, of an election that was hacked. And the problem is the beauty of these paperless systems, both these touchscreen voting machines and internet voting, by the way, which is another, which I know there's going to be a whole session on that. That's another really dangerous, I mean, that's the worst, actually. But the beauty of these systems that don't have paper ballots that were marked by the voters is there's no evidence, it's the, you know, I mean, it's very, very, very hard to prove that an election has been stolen. Not only because of the lack of evidence, but because of the resistance to looking. We saw that in the 2016 pro uh, recount, where there was great resistance even to doing recounts of a small number of states. And in fact, the Michigan recount, which Michigan is all paper, was halted in, by the courts. And of course, most of the country wasn't really adequately examined at all. So in fact, we don't know whether or not the 2016 machine election was hacked because nobody has done an adequate study to determine whether or not it was hacked. So going forward, we just can't allow this to happen. We have to fix these systems and we have to get paper ballots everywhere. So I'll just end with a quote from a uh, former uh, FBI Director Comey, which um, I completely support. They'll be back in 2020 they may be back in 2018, and one of the lessons they may draw from this is that they were successful because they introduced chaos and division and discord and so doubt about the nature of this amazing country of ours and our democratic process. I think they will be back in 2018. There are major, uh, major midterm elections coming up. There are even important elections coming up in 2017. The governors of New Jersey and, Pennsylvania, and sorry, Virginia are going to be re -elect, or elected in 2017. And... Um, there are a lot of bad machines. Pennsylvania, 80% of Pennsylvania is paperless voting machines that are incredibly insecure, 80%. And this is a major state. We've got to fix that. So thank you for the work you're doing, and thank you for your support. And I would, I would like to see if Logan Lamb could come up. Talk about Georgia. This is Georgia. I'm a pacer. All right, cool. Hey friends, so um, I'm Logan Lamb. I'm a cybersecurity researcher based out of Atlanta. I primarily do uh, wireless cybersecurity research, but since it was election season and we all like to break things, I really, really wanted to get my hands on some voting systems. So um, I ended up going down to the elections office in Fulton County and I was attempting to speak with the election supervisor, uh, Richard Barron, I think. And I was going to say, hey, I'm a you know, local cybersecurity researcher. I'd like to do some good work and help you guys. Well, uh, as you can imagine, I didn't get past the secretary. So um, she ran my card back to Richard Barron. And then they came back to me and let me know that all of the election systems in Georgia are actually handled at... Kennesaw State University by the Center for Election Systems. So immediately I thought this was kind of wacky, right? It's like, what, what is this university doing with all these systems? So um, prior to sending an email to the director there, I figured I'd try and get some you know, background information on the group and just see like, 
who are these people, what do they do? So um, I checked out their website and then you know, just fired off like the simplest Google dork ever. I, I was just like, hey, I'd like to see all of your documents and PDFs you have on this website, okay? Lo and behold, uh, there were some really, really interesting documents that were already cached by Google, okay? Uh, I clicked one of the links and what appeared to be in front of me was a list of voter names, okay? So at this point, I was like, is this real life? Is this happening right now? Um, so, yeah, I mean, this was just a web server. So I, I went up a couple directories, because um, it had like a directory structure in the route. And then I looked at their robots.txt, wrote a quick like bash script to curl everything off recursively. And then I went to lunch. Yeah, so uh, then I went to lunch, and when I came back, and I checked to see how much data I had on my computer, I had 15 gigs worth of data, y'all. It's crazy, crazy stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, amongst this 15 gigabytes worth of data, I had all of the voter registration information for everyone in Georgia, okay? So that includes um, names, addresses, birthdays, last four digits of your social, uh, also your full driver's license number, which seems relatively innocuous, but uh, you can actually use all that information to change people's um, registration with the DMV. So that's just a whole nother can of worms. Okay, what, what else was there? We had PDFs of election day passwords, and uh, this seemed to be the same across all counties, okay? And there were also um, some Jim's databases, and like to this day, I have no clue what those were doing on that server. It's just a web server. And um, from what I could gather, it looks like this server was being used to disseminate information to all of the counties. And uh, there was like a, a bulk update file, which had a bunch of voter registration information and a couple Windows binaries. Uh, the Center for Election Systems, they would actually tweet out every couple months and be like, hey, there's a new bulk update file that you all should uh, go download and run on your systems. Well, yeah, so it looks like this hilariously insecure system was being used to disseminate information related to the election systems. Well, I mean, it, it keeps getting worse, actually. <laughs> So uh, this web server, it was vulnerable to Drupageddon, okay? And Drupageddon is like the easiest exploit. It's easy mode. There are YouTube videos detailing how to pop boxes using Drupageddon. And this has been around since uh, 2014, I think. And I'm pretty sure it's 2017 now. So that's, that's no bueno. So uh, an attacker could trivially get root on this box that is being used to disseminate information. And amongst that information that they are intending to disseminate are Windows binaries. I mean, come on. So, I mean, an attacker could very trivially implant malware in that. And, uh, I mean, never mind actually getting root on that box and then more than likely being able to pivot in deeper into the Center for Election Systems networks. Uh, Okay, so uh, just to reiterate, the Center for Election Systems, they handle provisioning every single DRE in Georgia, okay? So, I mean, it makes for a hell of a target. And uh, they say that their testing networks are actually, um, you know, they're partitioned, segregated from whatever network that I happen to get, gain access to. But given what we've seen so far, I don't think they have the discipline to really do that. All right, so um, yeah, I found all this information, immediately questioned if this was real life, and then figured out uh, the best way to actually get this resolved. Because at the end of the day, this is always about building more secure systems. So um, I spent a day or two trying to craft an email to make it sound like I'm not some rando crazy guy who is getting into their networks. I sent that to the director for the Center for Election Systems. And um, yeah, I had a weird conversation with him, which I'll get to. So I, I sent him this email, 
And I didn't hear a response. I, I didn't wait 24 hours because I was really, really concerned about this. So I ended up getting his cell phone number and giving him a call, right? So I was like, hey, Merle, you, you, you got my email. You're actually fixing this, right? And he... Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so chatted with Merle King. He, um, he assured me they were going to fix this. So at that point, I dropped it. Um, fast forward to March. In March, I was working on the talk I'm going to be giving tomorrow, which you all should come to, Cable Tap. And uh, over beers, working with my buddies, I was talking to Chris Grayson, and I hadn't told him about this work previously. So he went and double-checked what I had accomplished, and they had not remediated it correctly. So, so then, of course, I proceeded to download everything again, right, to, to see if they had actually made any changes. Uh, the system was, uh, they fixed the Drupageddon issue, but they were still using the server to disseminate information as recently as uh, 2017. So um, he let an individual at KSU know who could actually get this issue resolved. Uh, they ended up bringing the FBI into it, and then I ended up having the feds come to my apartment unannounced, which uh, for, the, for those of you who haven't experienced that, I don't recommend it. It's not fun. Um, yeah, so I chatted with the feds a bit, and uh, yeah, as far as I know, I, I'm told they've actually fixed this issue now. I haven't really looked into it because the feds are unhappy with me. Yeah. Thank you, Logan. Sorry. So I don't know if anybody's moderating this, but um, I guess I have the mic. Yes. Logan, where? Yeah, so the GEMS databases, that's where all of the uh, votes are actually tallied. And I have no clue what those were doing on that server. Like, I don't have a real explanation there. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the GEMS databases are, are not where the votes are tallied. The, those votes are tallied on the GEMS machine. Um, what we think this is, because we're looking at the dates of the files that were when they were uploaded, um, they actually come after the elections. So it's possible that those GEMS databases were uh, tally totals that the counties then sent up to the election center after the elections. Any further questions? I can't see who asked the question. Oh, a question about open source. There. There are two uh, jurisdictions in the country, Los Angeles and Austin, Texas, uh, Travis County and Los Angeles County, who are building um, open source voting systems. And, and the elections community is certainly aware of open source as a possibility. Um, but uh, right now, there are none, as far as I know, in use in the United States. So uh, obviously, open source is preferable to uh, proprietary software. Uh, these. Uh, both of these systems are fairly far along, but at this point they need money to do the development work. So if you know somebody who wants to invest in these, in these systems, it would really help with replacing these machines if we had the open source systems, because they'd be cheaper. This is, a, this is the last question. We're going to have to, we're, we're running over time here. Uh, so we see this, we see this a lot. We see um, VPNs, we see network connections that are not supposed to be there by law or by practice. We see uh, VPNs, we see all sorts of terrible operations security practices in various jurisdictions all over the United States. I don't even think Wisconsin is the worst at all. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about this 
but we're going to have to cut this off now because the next session is going to have to start. So thank you all very much for being here.